This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Verve. With Verve, you can now binge all of your favorite Nickelodeon shows of the 90s, so stay tuned after the video to find out more. And click on the link in the description so you can start an ad-free 30-day trial of Verve Premium, or go to vrv.co slash yesterworld. For every idea that becomes a reality at the Disney theme parks, there are just as many that don't. Many never make it off the drawing board, and others are cancelled at the last minute, but some actually begin aspects of construction only to end up abandoned before completion. So let's explore five unfinished Walt Disney World projects and attractions, along with the traces that remain today. During the construction of Epcot, the World Showcase was to have a number of Day One attractions. These included experiences like El Rio del Tiempo, Meet the World, and the Rhine River Cruise. Riding on a gondola high above Rudersheim, Germany, it's one of the many experiences you can choose from on the Adventures by Disney Rhine River Cruise. Uh, well this is awkward. Same name, but not the one I'm talking about. The ride was partially based off the real-life cruise in Germany and would be housed in, of course, the Germany Pavilion. The attraction was similar to the other experiences in the World Showcase and would celebrate Germany's cultural heritage, but at the time of Epcot's construction, Disney had yet to find a sponsor for the German-inspired boat ride. Regardless, they began building the ride's show building, specifically the area for the loading and unloading docks. They even incorporated the attraction's exit into the neighboring restaurant Beer Garden. Unfortunately, Disney never found a sponsor, and as Epcot soon fell behind schedule and over budget, construction was put on indefinite hold. Would you? During previews in the weeks leading up to the grand opening, the ride's planned entrance had a large wooden gate, but by the time the park officially opened, the wooden gates were gone. But here's where it gets really interesting. It is a fact that from opening day, visitors could buy a souvenir book that talks about the Rhine River Cruise as part of Phase 2 of Epcot's World Showcase. By 1987, as shown in another souvenir book, a plaster wall went over the planned entrance and was decorated with a mural. But the big question has always been just what was in its place between the wooden gates in 1982 and the mural in 87. When going over video footage during that period, you can spot a large group of people staring directly at the planned entrance. Brightening up the image shows, to me, what looks like a display of some kind, definitely not a mural painted on a wall. Whatever it was, it's believed around 1984 to 85, the Rhine River Cruise was officially shelved. Soon after, the section was closed off and converted into a snack area to complement Beer Garden. As far as the partly built show building for the unloading and loading docks, they were eventually used for storage and for show rehearsals. The original exit path through Beer Garden would also be utilized for the restaurant's buffet carts. And finally, in the late 80s, the concept of Rhine River Cruise was reworked as Maelstrom for Norway's pavilion. So the next time you visit the Germany pavilion, take a step back and imagine the attraction that could have been. For a country that has zero attractions, the Japan Pavilion sure had a lot of potential ones during planning. The Mount Fuji coaster was to be a Matterhorn-style attraction racing through, as the name implies, Mount Fuji. Another was a sort of hybrid between a walkthrough attraction and a Circle Vision 360 theater. But like Run River Cruise, another made it past the conceptual phase and as I mentioned earlier was planned as a day one attraction. But unlike Rhine River Cruise, the entire show building was constructed for an attraction called Meet the World. Here's American industrial robots telling the history of Japan, program not to mention World War II. If the name sounds familiar, it's because the attraction did appear in Tokyo Disneyland from 1983 to 2002. Meet the World told the story of Japan's history through the use of animatronics and rear projections. It was incredibly similar to Carousel of Progress, only instead of revolving around the outside of the stages, you revolved on the inside. It even included a catchy melody by the iconic Sherman Brothers. <laughs> We meet the world with love. We meet the world with love. 
So you're probably asking what happened to Epcot's version. To answer, it's important to backtrack a bit. As originally planned, visitors would have entered the Japanese castle, aka the Meet the World show building. The building itself would have had two floors, the first being an access point to the Mitsukushi store along with a number of sponsorship-based displays. The second floor would have housed the actual attraction as well as the queue and pre-show. Suffice to say, the two floors, displays, and attractions needed to be very intricately structured. However, according to insiders, once the show building was complete, they realized miscalculations were made as far as the dimensions, support beam installations, and its overall structure. But it wasn't just a quick fix type of situation, but one that would essentially involve a reconstruction of the entire show building. As Epcot's construction was already behind schedule and over budget, the project was put on hold and the building was off limits to visitors. As can be seen in the 1982 souvenir book, it was rescheduled to open in 1983. Of course, this never happened. Instead, it was decided to partially utilize some of the show building as an expansion of the Mitsukushi store and as an exhibit area. The back portion and second floor is believed to be used for storage, rehearsals, or just as unused space. In December of 1999, Disney announced they'd be adding another value resort to the Walt Disney World property. It was to be built at Hourglass Lake, just south of the Caribbean Resort, later revealed with the title of Pop Century. It was to be split both literally and thematically on each side of the lake. The first half of the 20th century was to be known as the Legendary Years, and the second half as the Classic Years. Connecting the hotels in both theming and accessibility was the Generation Gap Bridge. Construction began in the year 2000 on both the Legendary Years and the Classic Years, though the Classic Years was to be the first open in December of 2001. However, with the tragic events of September 11th, tourism plummeted. The grand opening was cancelled, and work stopped on both halves of the new hotel. Work resumed on the Classic Years portion a few months later, but the Legendary Years was left abandoned. But this was only supposed to be temporary. First, we have Disney's Value Resorts, including our newest, Disney's Pop Century Resort. The Classic Years portion was finally open for business in December of 2003. However, even as of 2004, it was clear work still hadn't resumed on the Legendary Years portion on the other side of the lake. And though Disney still insisted an expansion was on the way, by 2007, as you can see here, the entire property was still abandoned and had gone virtually untouched for nearly a decade. But with the amount of misinformation I've seen, I think it's important to note just how much of the Legendary Years had actually been completed. In terms of basic construction, only two of the three 1940s hotel buildings had actually been completed, with the foundation of the others in various states of completion. However, the lobby, aka Legendary Hall, was by far the furthest in development. It wasn't until 2010 that work continued on the long-abandoned hotel, only now it would be reworked as the Art of Animation All Suites Resort. This is Disney's Art of Animation Resort, your gateway into an incredible realm of Disney and Disney Pixar animated films. By late 2012, both phases of the Art of Animation were finished and open to the public. However, it is interesting to note that while the Art of Animation is labeled officially as an All Suites Resort, the Little Mermaid buildings are actually standard hotel rooms. During its construction, the two already built standard room Legendary Years buildings were left intact. This means that technically it is possible to stay at one of the hotels originally built for the missing half of the Pop Century Resort. So perhaps a more fitting name is the five decades of the last half of the Century Resort. I still haven't heard back from Disney about my idea, but I'll let you know when I do. In 1980, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was released into theaters and became a critical and box office success. The movie was actually based on a novel called Who Censored Roger Rabbit. In the year the book was released, its film rights were purchased by the Walt Disney Company for $35,000. The Oscar goes to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And the Oscar goes to... Arthur Schmidt for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. With the success of Roger Rabbit, it was a no-brainer to include the character in a number of videos and aspects of the parks, but that was only to be the beginning. Though not present in early concept art, at some point it was decided that Roger Rabbit should have his own land at Disney's MGM Studios. 
Sometimes it's referred to as Roger Rabbit's Hollywood, though a more consistent name was Maroon Studios, as seen in the film. At some point, this was revised to be closely integrated into MGM Studios' first major expansion, Sunset Boulevard. Who needs a car in LA? We got the best public transportation system in the world. Just as it appears in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Sunset Boulevard was to be themed around a time in Hollywood nearing the end of the red trolley car era. Sunset Boulevard would have featured working trolley cars taking you from one end to the other, with a recreation of the terminal and bar seen in the movie. Potentially, the trolley cars would have also taken you into Maroon Studios. Smile, the land itself would have featured three main attractions, a simulator ride called Toontown Trolley, a dark ride called Benny the Cab, and Baby Herman's Runaway Baby Buggy, though whether it would have been a motion simulator or dark ride is often speculated. In an effort to tease this upcoming land, a number of easter eggs, props, and nods to the film were included when the park opened in 1990. There was even an entire building devoted to Roger Rabbit at the end of the Backlot Tour. It was a recreation of the final location in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and included countless props and displays from the movie. Unfortunately, at some point shortly after MGM Studios' grand opening, Disney CEO Michael Eisner, hey, it wouldn't be a Yesterworld video without him popping up at least once, and Roger Rabbit's executive producer Steven Spielberg had a major conflict. Who owned Roger Rabbit? Who had ultimate creative control in the parks? How should the profits be divided? Things like that. By 1992, though Disneyland's version of Toontown was well into production, the Sunset Boulevard expansion went ahead without Roger Rabbit, and the functioning trolley cars were scrapped as well. <laughs> There's a wild new ride at Disneyland, and it's out of control! When Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin opened alongside Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland, it offered a glimpse of the land that could have been. But even today, you can still find traces alluding to Roger Rabbit's unbuilt land, and even a few examples of how the trolley cars may have been implemented. It's no secret that Disney and Universal have long been theme park rivals, but this also applies to their themed dining experiences. In the mid-90s, both Disney and Universal were pitched an idea by a company named Late Night Magic for a revolutionary new dining experience. Instead of rock and roll, or even a rainforest, it revolved around the legendary David Copperfield and his illusions. Big Mac. It's magic. Desperate to one-up their rival, Disney offered the company a far better deal to build a restaurant on their property, and in December of 1996, Disney officially announced Copperfield Magic Underground for MGM Studios. The restaurant was to be a place like none other, with a budget of a whopping $18 million. Its exterior was to have a 40-foot tall figure surrounded by massive gas torches, and would display a mesmerizing 90-second light show once every hour. Inside was to be full of incredible illusions. Tables and bars would appear to levitate. Diners would suddenly disappear and reappear, or even seem to be cut in half. The ambitious restaurant was to open at MGM Studios in 1998, and reside between the front entrance and stadium for Fantasmic, and alongside the restaurant was to be a retail store in downtown Disney. But when Disney announced this partnership, its first location of a Plan 20 across the US was already in the middle of construction in New York City. So, what happened? It's a very, very long story, but it basically came down to its ambitiousness, Copperfield's creative control, and the decline of themed restaurant popularity. You see, David Copperfield's vision for the illusions and effects were unprecedented to say the least. This, and his demand for absolute perfection, caused the budget of the New York location to skyrocket. The company in charge was forced to find new investors, but as construction continued, money soon ran out again, and they were forced to find even more investors. This would even include Disney, who would invest $5 million as a way to speed up construction and get started on their location. Two weeks! Let's do it in two weeks! Hey! The first location in New York was only an estimated six weeks away from completion, but even with almost double of the original budget, making it the most expensive restaurant ever built, money was running out again. However, investors refused more funding unless Copperfield gave up some creative control to keep costs down. 
he wouldn't, and all parties involved essentially came to a creative and financial standoff. Because of this, construction on the New York location halted indefinitely in early 1998, and despite reports of resuming an opening in the spring of 1999, before the end of the year, with rent costing $300,000 a month, all $34 million was gone. Another factor at play was a decline in popularity among themed restaurants, with many saying the novelty had simply worn off. With no one willing to compromise, and despite the New York location being so close to completion, all incarnations of Copperfield's Magic Underground were cancelled. So, the last couple of months have seen us hemorrhaging money. The planned location for the retail store in downtown Disney would eventually become the new location for the Harley Davidson shop. The Magic Underground in New York was gutted, going through a number of tenants before finally becoming a Mama Sparrow restaurant, which remains to this day. But if you look closely, you can still see traces of the original exterior for Magic Underground. And while photos of its interior are non-existent, some of the props have since surfaced online, and it's believed even more are just rotting away in a storage facility. It wasn't that long ago that unless I had magical powers, the only way I could watch my favorite Nickelodeon shows of the past were through annoying DVD sets, low quality and illegal rips online, or paying through the nose for cable. But with Verve, you can now have access to all of your favorites, and be able to watch them in stunning clarity. So if you're a quality snob like me, it's a Nickelodeon dream. Take a trip down memory lane with live action shows like Legends of the Hidden Temple, Are You Afraid of the Dark, and my personal favorites, all that, and Kenan and Kel. Or bring out your nostalgia with cartoons like Doug, Angry Beavers, or the Wild Thornberries. But Verve has way more to offer than just Nickelodeon, so whether you're a fan of anime, documentaries, or even past online hits like Red vs. Blue, they have something for just about everyone. Best of all, you can download the app on your favorite devices and watch your favorite shows on the go, anywhere, anytime. You can even download episodes to your device for offline viewing. So to get started, just click on the link in the description to start your 30-day ad-free trial of Verve Premium today. Or go to vrv.co slash yesterworld. To avoid missing out on future content, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you want to help support the making of future videos, check out my Patreon and shop in the description. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Yesterworld.